Welcome everyone to today's uh, book event on gender protest and political change in Africa. My name is Nadia Al Ali and I'm director of the Center for Middle East Studies here at Brown University, where I'm also a professor of anthropology and Middle East studies. And it's my great pleasure to co-host today's event. Um, so the Center for Middle East Studies uh, this year is starting a couple of new initiatives, one of them focusing on gender and sexuality with reference to the Middle East and its diasporas and also working in close collaboration with colleagues work in other regions. Uh, and now I'd like to um, ask my colleague, uh, Professor Dan Smith, uh, who is co-hosting the event to introduce himself and the Center of African Studies. Dan? Thank you, Nadia. It's my pleasure to, uh, to co-host this event. I'm the director, as Nadia said, of the Africa Initiative at the Watson Institute and at Brown University. And I'm also a professor of anthropology and I'm delighted to be part of this event. And we're looking forward to our conversations and discussions with the panelists and this great book. Great, so I'm now going to introduce our speakers, guests today. Uh, first one is uh, Dr. Avino Okesh. Um, Avino, who was actually a colleague of mine uh, at SOAS uh, a few years back. So um, Dr. Avino Okesh is a lecturer at the Center for Gender Studies at SOAS University of London. And her teaching and research interest lies in the nexus between gender, sexuality, and nation state making projects as they occur specifically in conflict and post-conflict societies. And prior to her appointment at the Center for Gender Studies at SOAS, she contributed to knowledge production and transfer through an adjunct teaching position with the African Leadership Center at King's College London. Dr. Okesh also brings a much longer history of gender and conflict programming work in Africa with a range of international and national organizations. So welcome, Avino. Uh, our second guest is uh, Sarah Sumaya Abid who is a feminist researcher based in Cairo. Sarah holds an MA in uh, human rights from UCL. Sarah, could you switch on your camera, please? So uh, Sarah holds an MA in human rights from UCL, University of London, and was part of Operation Anti-Sexual Harassment and Assault. She has worked with HarassMap, Care International Egypt, and Sarah is also a former teaching assistant at the British University in Egypt. Her paper uh, titled, How do sex workers perceive their working identity? Um, Case studies in Egypt has been published in Kohol. So this is uh, of course a journal that is um, based online and available freely in English and Arabic. And is really sort of cutting edge in terms of presenting work on gender and sexuality in the region and its diaspora and, and beyond really. And then our third speaker is Sarah Nogdala, who is joining us from Khartoum. She is a gender consultant and researcher from the Sudan. She holds an MA in gender studies from SOAS uh, as well, University of London, and has a BA in international relations from the American University of Sharjah. Sarah's research interests are grounded in the relationship between gender, Islam, and the state, and has written extensively on gender citizenship and feminist activism in Sudan. Welcome, Sarah. So uh, very unfortunately, our fourth speaker, fellow Jeanne Anumo, is unable to join us today. Um, so, you know, we are sad about that, but uh, we hope that we'll have a um, good conversation based on, you know, the, the different uh, chapters and contributions. So, um, Avina, I'd like to start out asking you, um, so the book, uh, which you know, I, I greatly enjoyed reading. I, I read it a couple of weeks ago. Um, really looks at um, the very diverse trajectories of conflict and state society relations on the continent, and um, is providing us both, you know, with you know very specific case studies, but also there are some underlying themes. And you know, one of the themes that that is obvious is how. Um, state society relations have transformed over time and you know when I did my PhD in the 90s on the Egyptian women's movement it was all about civil society and civil society was the context in which women mobilized and in which you know social transformation took place but 
there's this shift that you're describing, or it's it's in this this moment where this uh, shift has taken place that you are grounding your book and looking at the sort of relationship between youth and gender. So I'm very interested to to know a bit more about the trajectory. How did you actually come about, uh, you know, putting this uh, edited volume together? Uh, what was your thinking behind it? And what, in your view, are some of the main contributions of the book? Thank you very much, Nadia. And once again, let me just thank you for hosting what will be the last of the book discussions that we'll be having for this edited publication. As Nadia noted, uh, she and I were colleagues at SOAS, so it's uh, really uh, an honor for me to have you host uh, this particular book discussion. So uh, the emergence of the book arises through a range of stories, and I'm only going to share one, which is the fact that in 2016, when I joined SOAS, we were hosting as the Center for Gender Studies, these bi-weekly seminars. And during one of the seminars, we hosted a conversation that was looking at the question of student protests, specifically thinking about fees must fall in South Africa. And fellow Jean, who you mentioned was part of the panel, who was locating her own reflections in relation to student movements uh, in Kenya, where she was a student movement leader during her days at the university. This intervention struck me uh, and the conversations during this intervention struck me as an important point uh, around which to expand the ways in which people who were not located in the African continent thought about the role of youthhood, thought about the role of university students in fostering and pushing for change. Because at the point, there were also very heightened conversation about decolonizing universities, decolonizing curriculum. And when people looked to the African continent, it seemed that they only looked to South Africa. There seemed to be this assumption that conversations around decolonization and the role of university students uh, in social change and transformation began in 2015, which is when fees must fall protests sort of hit their crescendo. And so this was part of the impetus to expand a conversation around the history of academics, university students in expanding debates around academic freedom, Africanization of universities. Uh, and so I began to look for a number of people who could have that conversation in written form. But also at that particular moment, there were a range of protests that were happening around the African continent, from the Oromo protests in Ethiopia, the protests in Burkina Faso were happening. And in the introduction, in the introduction chapter, I map the number of protests that happen across different parts of the African continent that are often structured around service delivery questions. It's really around the material questions uh, for citizens on a day-to-day -day basis. So it is evident, therefore, that in the 2015 uh, going forward, citizens have found protests, citizens have found direct action as one of the most important ways to challenge regimes, to challenge the ineffective ways in which uh, national governments are crafting a social and economic program that is considered inclusive. In essence, it is a move away from thinking about the ballot box as the only way through which to change governments, but to recognize that elections have become manipulated, elections have become performances, and that citizens are taking their power back. Because in effect, if you vote for a leader, that legitimacy of governance is derived from the citizens. And so when citizens take to the street, they are, they are having a direct conversation with the regimes about the, the lack of legitimacy that is occurring in terms of how uh, the country or countries are being run. So it's this convergence of interest, a fees must call conversation, the number of protests that are increasingly occurring across the African continent from 2015 to now, and an interest in examining what is it that happens to this protest that frame themselves as revolutionary, that frame themselves as movements that are designed to really deal with the socioeconomic and cultural questions that lead to the exclusion of the vast majority. Yet women's questions, gender equality questions always end up on the periphery of those demands. So we can invoke the number of women and girls and the sort of equality struggles that manifest in Tahrir Square, that manifest at the University of Johannesburg, that manifest in Khartoum. You know, we can invoke all these figures and, and, and push out all these images praising the importance of women's participation and, the, and women's voices. But yet when change arrives, when the strongman has been pushed out of office, women and girls and young people in particular are told, hold up, 
uh, you must now wait for your turn. Let's remember that the challenges for equality are much greater than questions around gendered inequalities. They're much greater than questions of youthhood. So let's set that aside for a minute and let's deal with the urgent questions of the country. And this is something that all of the authors pick up in their chapters to trouble this idea of why gender inequality questions are, are relegated to the sidelines. In each of the chapters, we begin to see a generational moment in which all of the authors are grappling with what it means for younger generation of feminist activists to center their demands uh, uh, within movements that are claiming themselves as re revolutionary and movements that are, are purporting to project a much broader vision for change and transformation than that which older generations have potentially presented. Now, I think it is evident that even going into this publication, I could argue that I would know the answer. We know the, recalc the, the recalcitrance of patriarchy. We know that patriarchy and its bedfellows, whether it's capitalism or white supremacy, will always restructure the ways in which power machinations occur. The minute you open one lever, patriarchy reorganizes itself. The minute you push another lever, capitalism reorganizes itself. But it was an opportunity for us to begin to examine the shifting ways that heteropatriarchy is reorganizing itself within contemporary movements. What are the different ways through which uh, technology is being mobilized as a route through which to push out young women who have found social media as a space to organize nationally and transnationally? What are the ways in which patriarchy is beginning to mobilize queer narratives, trans-based narratives, and we see this in the South Africa chapter, to begin to rewrite particular heteronormative ideas around gender and sexuality or femininity and masculinity within these societies. So it's about opening up these opportunities for rethinking uh, heteronormativity, for thinking about the new sites uh, through which feminist activists are mobilizing change that I believe is an important contribution I believe, and this is something I argue more uh, a lot, is that publications, uh, academic publications, scholarly publications, in my view, should not necessarily be prescriptive. Our objective here is not to provide you with a set of answers. Mm -hmm. Our objective here is to provide you with a set of reflections mm -hmm. from activists who have been doing this work, from scholars who have been thinking about this work, so that anyone who is going out there to use direct action to think about protest movements as a site from which to propel change can look back at some of the lessons that other movements have experienced and on some of the challenges that have encountered so that we do not repeat the same mistakes. And I, and I think this is one of the great offerings of the publication, an opportunity to have a deep dive through very specific countries, mm. experiencing very different things yet manifesting uh, uh, in similar ways and drawing out on the, the specificities of how patriarchy reorganizes the specificities of how younger feminists are pushing back, uh, the opportunities that are evident in mobilizing in the digital sphere, but also the cross uh, transnational lessons that are emerging in terms of foregrounding the importance of invisible labor, foregrounding the importance of care as a critical part of protest action and change. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, one of the things, uh, many things that I really <clears throat> enjoy about the book is that it's really trying to challenge the privileging of academic knowledge production and also really providing a platform for activist uh, knowledge production. <clears throat> Excuse me. So before um, handing it over to Dan, um, who's going to ask um, each uh, guest a uh, question around the chapter, I just uh, wanted to say something about the structure of the event. Um, so we'll be in conversation for about 45 to 50 minutes, but we're encouraging all of you to put in your questions either in the Q&A function if you're joining the webinar or through the YouTube uh, function, we will be receiving those questions. So anytime, uh, if you have some questions now, please start putting them in, we'll pick them up later. So now over to you, Dan. Thank you. So. Um... Nadia and Awino both mentioned the fact that the chap there are middle chapters to this book that offer case studies around these, around these questions and issues. And so we're lucky enough to have three of the authors with us today. And what I wanna do is give each of them an opportunity to speak briefly about their chapters. We'll start with Sarah Abed and her chapter about Egypt, co-authored chapter about Egypt, which is called A Revolution Deferred Sexual and Gender-Based Violence in Egypt. So Sarah, we'd like to hear from you, please. <laughs> 
Thank you so much. Uh, and thank you for the invitation and the introduction as well, Nadia. And I'm so glad to be here with you, Dan, Awino, and Sara. So uh, in our chapter, A Revolution Deferred Sexual and Gender-Based Violence in Egypt, Radwa, my co-author, and I were interested to examine the dilemma and tension between feminist emancipation and revolutions with nationalist undertones when pushing back against misogyny that often causes anxiety and fears to authoritarian heteropatriarchal regimes that is also increasingly militarized like Egypt. So basically, we were arguing that sexual violence was paradoxically one of the biggest obstacles as women protesters from all walk of life were subject to indiscriminate and brutal forms of violence by state and societal uh, alike, societal actors. But also we were trying to show that it was also an opportunity for women's emancipation in the Jan 25th revolution. So uh, when looking at the literature, femi feminist scholars generally have noted that revolutions with nationalist undercurrent tend to be masculine projects that usually advance masculine interest. The notion of nation itself, as we all know, is gendered and women participation is endorsed if it seeks to advance uh, existing nationalist goals and shunned when advancing alternative feminist agenda. However, we were interested to also look at how women have consciously exploited uh, their positions in order to justify their present, uh, presence in their revolutions. And when we look at uh, sexual violence, for example, it was even, uh, uh, the, it was even the efforts of these feminist activists, even before the revolution, that have endured several struggles to bring the issue at the forefront uh, or to the public discourse. And then, uh, when looking at the Jan 25th revolution and all its subsequent uprising with its all forced brutal reality, uh, we see, we kind of see how it subverted and created an opportunity for the fruits of such efforts to actually be finally reaped. Uh, when Radu and I were writing this chapter, uh, we were kind of arguing that if this momentum in the movement against sexual violence is sustained, it is likely to pave the way and the likelihood of such gains to be actually translated in a more tangible ways throughout the law, in the law, in the laws, for example. And we were actually witnessing that, like looking now at this current movement or the current moment as we speak, um, the ongoing feminist revolution, uh, um, uh, movement that is perceived by many as the start of the feminist revolution, uh, myself included, uh, we actually see how uh, uh, it started with ABZ, uh, someone who, uh, a perpetrator, um, where women floated Instagram to actually speak about uh, their sexual assaults and rape stories. Uh, so this is how it started. However, it actually moved beyond that and it started to connect different struggles and other forms and faces of violence like the TikTok women. And uh, even though the virtual space uh, it continued to be used as a tool of uh, surveillance, uh, I think it also eased the process of connecting different and diverse backgrounds and age groups together in their fight against patriarchy and injustice uh, more broadly. Uh, so when looking at the Jan 25th revolution and its continuous tension between nationalism and feminist emancipation and looking at our chapter, back to our chapter, revolutionary forces, including the so-called progressive left, did not actually view gender equality as a critical demand underlining the success of the revolution in the quest for social justice. And this was actually evident, uh, especially uh, just weeks after the 25th of revolution, uh, when women were marching in light of uh, the International Women's Day and they were attacked, the protest uh, was actually attacked. And this sharp contrast between these attacks and the egalitarian nature of the Tahrir Square made us realize that people are actually willing to support women as revolutionaries, but not necessarily the notion or explanation of a uh, definition of re revolutionaries would actually also entail uh, women uh, seeking uh, gender equality. Uh, However, this didn't stop women and it was used as an opportunity uh, uh, where women were at the forefront of anti-harassment initiatives, opposing chivalry attitudes that was particularly evident uh, during the marches and uh, the mob assaults, uh, the virginity tests, uh, the blue bra and the list goes on. Um, and women rallied their efforts uh, through marching and chanting that Banat Masr Khatta Ahmar, the daughters of Egypt are a red line. Uh, and one of them, one of the marches actually women were holding knives as a powerful political statement. 
It was also manifested in women's opposition to men forming circles around them uh, to shield away perpetrators of violence. And initi uh, initiatives uh, such as Opantish, I recall like we had this uh, long discussions where we were insisting we as women to be part of intervention groups to challenge this kind of protection notion around us while trying to rescue victims and survivors of sexual violence out, uh, out of what we called at the time circle of hell. Uh, perhaps the biggest accomplishment was uh, the amendment of Article 306 in the Egyptian Penal Code in 2014, uh, where for the first time in Egyptian legal history, uh, sexual harassment was actually legally codified. And now last summer, we're witnessing another accomplishment like on the legal front, where uh, the law was amended to protect the identities of victims and survivors of sexual violence at the time of uh, reporting. Uh, of course, there is still some skepticism toward the law implementation, especially uh, we all know that like, or it's, it's clear for us that those who are implementing it are those who are, are the same one who are abusing it. However, in our chapter, what we were trying to shed light on is that how these moments of forced reality of extreme violence could also act as opportunities for movement building in our quest for social justice and radical transformation. It's these opportunities that should not be taken lightly, even at moments of recurring despair, because these moments it will actually reshape our uh, feminist uh, collective consciousness uh, with all the negative and positive experience that this journey could actually entail. Uh, and it's actually, it's these moments that actually help us to be hopeful in a way to keep on reimagining alternative feminist futures. Uh, yes, we're now in another moment of despair uh, and the state power again and again, again, is brutally expanding its legal and moral architecture to police and control our bodies. Take for example, the crackdown of the TikTok women or uh, the witnesses who were turned into criminals in the ferment uh, crime. I still believe uh, however, I still believe that there is a clear shift and it's like everyone is actually feeling it in the current discourse where we're moving beyond the victim blaming discourse that was actually heavily present during revolutionary time. Uh, and we're publicly open, opening up discussion that is centered on the notion of consent, challenging slut shaming discourses, among other things. Um, and uh, that's it. But I would like, I would really love to uh, actually end uh, with Sara Ahmed's quote from Living a Feminist Life, because I think it so much resonates with everything that is happening here in Egypt and even uh, more broadly on an international level, that feminists need feminism to survive. And I think this is our motto, especially now. Thank you so much. And I'm looking forward to your questions. Thank you, Sarah. And we'll have opportunities for questions after we hear about uh, two of the other middle chapters. So I want to invite uh, Sarah Nugdala now to talk about her chapter regarding uh, the Sudan, the title of which was The Revolution Continues Sudanese Women's Activism. Sarah? Hi, thank you. Thank you, Dan, Nadja, and Awino for the introduction. So my chapter is entitled uh, The Revolution Continues Sudanese Women's Activism. And my chapter historicized uh, Sudanese women's activism in the last uh, two decades of the former Islamist regime. And the starting point for me was how the state mobilized gender as part of its Islamization project and how the control of women and women's bodies was central to that process. And then I looked at how this was later cemented through a set of public order laws that police women's dress code and behavior in public, um, looking at how in the informal sector were particularly um, subjected to the violence of these laws and their arbitrary application. So an understanding of these laws and policies under the new regime revealed the mobilizing factors of the Sudanese women's movement throughout the years of the um, former regime. And the chapter looks at particular moments of heightened repression against women and analyzes the feminist activism happening around those moments. I also looked at how women's activism was met with specific gendered violence seen in microspaces um, by other actors in society, but also by the state and how this took the form of clo the closure of civic space and the suffocating of dissenting voices. Um, uh, there was a turning point, however, in the responses to uh, women's activism and the discourse surrounding feminist activism generally in last year's revolution, which I briefly address in the chapter. So apart from the successes of the youth rising up to their generational challenges and achieving what many believed was unthinkable, 
um, while insisting on peaceful protest action, the revolution saw a newfound celebration of women activists who prior to the revolution were shamed and vilified for their work and were now suddenly being celebrated internationally. So what my analysis was interested in was how the celebration of women at the front lines does not change the gendered experiences of movement building. So despite being at the front lines, women experience the harassment and assault of their bodies, the silencing of their demands, um, and reminding us again that gender remains central even in progressive spaces, um, even in revolutionary spaces that are intended to be about freedom. But more importantly, um, it reminds us that visibility does not always mean justice on the ground. Uh, this was responded to um, the injustices happening at protest sites uh, were responded to with feminist mobilizing within the revolution, addressing bodily violence in the movement and just the disillusionment of being famed for driving a movement without their demands being heard. And, and um, this was seen in women forming safe spaces within protest sites, like I said, but um, also in the formation of a group of women coming together under the name Sudan Women for Change to address their demands under the transitional period. And this movement not only spoke to women, but gave focus to uh, women from marginalized regions in particular. So the revolution has been very telling in terms of how we perceive or position women's activism and how our erasure is constantly being confronted. Um, which brings me to the main takeaway from the chapter. And that is that resistance transcends Bashir's time. It was happening under his regime during the revolution and even now during the transitional period. Um, just telling us again that the labor and resistance of feminist activism has and will always be there even if it's not publicized or even if it's not visible. Um, and yeah, so while patriarchy is morphing and extending its tentacles, so too does feminist activism in order to confront it and resist it. So ultimately the revolution continues. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sarah. So uh, we look forward to coming back to you uh, shortly. Finally, I, I want to invite Owina to speak again, because in addition to being the editor of the, of the book, she was also an author of one of the middle chapters about Kenya, the title of which was Youth, Gender, and Feminist Descent. So Owina, if you wouldn't mind saying a bit about that chapter, that would be great. Thank you. So one of the sort of underlying, uh, uh, underguarding frameworks for thinking about contemporary protests across the African continent is youthhood. I think there's a widely held recognition that these are protests and movements that are driven by young people. But yet we also know that the scholarship around youthhood, particularly as it connects to the African continent, is one that has always been framed in a negative way. So youthhood is a problem. The youth bulge is something that needs to be resolved. The reason why young people are taking to the streets is because of the high youth de demographic dynamics, demographic dynamics in the African continent, which the governments of the day are not necessarily able to plan for. So the youth bulge, turning the youth bulge into a demographic dividend is how this scholarship you know, articulates the, the challenge of the large youthful population. But a second component of that is thinking about youth as a problem. So you have large numbers of people who are not absorbed into the market through uh, a, a sort of economic program that allows jobs to flourish in specific ways, which means that young people are therefore presented as being much more liable to be violent or to, to resort to violent outcomes as a means to claim their space within uh, the national sphere. So cr the criminalization of youthhood, the criminalization of young people and the framing of young people always through the lens of violence. But yet we also know that this scholarship on youthhood is a scholarship that is deeply gendered. In essence, when they're talking about youth, they are talking about young men. So more often than not, the conversations about how youthhood travels across gender is one that has, is not necessarily picked up in a sort of very firm way. But there are uh, you know, pockets of scholarship that are sought to problematize the questions of how young women in particular across the African continent experience youthhood, the sort of elasticity of youthhood where uh, for, 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 for men, you can be in, in my country, Kenya, the youth category expands until you're 40 something, right? So it is an elastic category that is often really connected to questions about employment, labor, and, uh, and uh, social income, uh, 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 social income or social progress, if you will, economic progress, if you will, and less about the sort of number, the age limit that international bodies have placed in terms of categorization of youthhood. 
But this liberty of expansion of youth is only one that is, is, is granted to men, right? For young women, the minute that you get married, the minute that you have a child, you're no longer youth, you're considered to be a woman. And the sort of social cultural demands that accompany uh, womanhood begin to be foisted upon you. Now, what a lot of the scholarship that I draw on in relation to this chapter begins to pick up ideas about the loss of social capital, uh, the, the ways in which young men, youth, youth political leaders, um, youth activists who are often male travel in social and political spaces is unencumbered of the gendered roles that society pushes upon them. So youthhood as a category continues to be one, even if freed from the negativity that frames it in, in scholarship, is still one that is deeply gendered and makes invisible the sort of agency and contributions of young women in our societies who are not necessarily ascribing to these definitions of youthhood or who are not bound by these social cultural frames around youthhood. And so what I do with the uh, youthhood and uh, gender and feminist descent chapter is to begin to draw on some of my own experiences of working with young feminists in Kenya in particular around very specific campaigns that were speaking to ideas around uh, uh, gender, uh, particularly women's leadership in the public sphere and the ways in which violence is mobilized in the public sphere designed to push women out of spaces that are constructed as being male, a male domain uh, and, and male in nature. So the, both of the chapters, uh, bo both of the, the case studies that I used to tease out, you know, the sort of dissent that young feminists are, are exhibiting both through the ways in which they're organizing, but their claims to public space point to the mobilization of violence, violence as a political strategy, violence as a political tool, violence as a disciplinary force, and how that comes to be waged both by political leaders, state actors and non-state actors. But there's a class dynamic here because the two cases that I pick speak to very different kinds of women that are being used, if you will, as, as, uh, as cases to force a public discourse around the disciplinary use of violence against women in the public domain. And it is this class dynamics that begins to allow us to examine the recalcitrance of patriarchy or the ways in which patriarchy is only comfortable with particular kind of women. So you have a political leader, and this is the case of Rachel Shebesh, a woman member, a, a woman member of parliament in Kenya, who is attacked publicly in front of the media. But the kind of support that you see for her is one that draws on the ideas around rogue women and women who are indisciplined and therefore uh, deserve uh, the kind of violence that is meted out against them because this kind of violence is is expressly designed to discipline them into specific forms of femininity. On the other hand, you find a younger woman who is raped and, and the, the ways in which the, the case is dealt with by the legal system elicits a different kind of response from the larger uh, community uh, uh, in the social media sphere, specifically in Kenya, because this is a young woman from a poor community. So there are a range of class-based narratives that are being mobilized here that project her as innocent, that project her as somebody deserving of protect, pro, uh, protection. So this juxtaposition of the rogue woman and the innocent girl and the ways in which society mobilizes protection for different kinds of women is what I begin to pick up in these two case studies, but always keeping attentive or always remaining attentive rather to the fact that these are, these, are, are, these are processes of activism that are led by young feminist activists. These are processes of activism that mobilize greatly uh, the technological uh, sphere, social media in particular, to generate a broader discourse around violence, a broader discourse around feminism than ever before. But I also point to, you know, uh, and speak back, if you will, to this idea around the fact that social media activism has no impact by beginning to pull out the ways in which social media activism is often always accompanied by offline activism and begins to point to the ways in which we see the mobilization of actors across different spheres, whether they're from formal non-governmental organizations, uh, individual feminist activists at the time, I was not aligned to any organization, to mobilize the range of resources towards building this campaign uh, around these two specific cases. 
So again, it challenges or, 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 or pulls out some uh, thinking around what happens when you move out of the framework of thinking as a non-governmental organization, the NGOization of our feminist movements and the harm that that has done. And that when you begin to free yourself from uh, an NGO modality of thinking about pushing for social change, we are broadening networks, we are enabling a greater range of meshworks to develop, uh, to push forward, uh, uh, a, a greater political discourse around gender violence, but also to broaden the ways in which we're building movements across generations and across uh, the nation, away from the city, but also uh, to the sort of peri-urban areas and to other smaller towns. Thank you so much, Awina. I wanna hand it over to Nadia to begin the question period. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, I mean, the, the whole issue of, um, especially the young generation of feminists trying to uh, not only address previous taboo issues, but thinking around new ways of organizing. I mean, that's something that clearly cuts across. I mean, I'm very familiar with those debates in the context of the Middle East, and it's very interesting to see how, how this cuts across. Well, what I'd like to ask you all, actually, I mean, uh, reading the various chapters, patriarchy looms largely, right? <laughs> and I want us to um, sort of think a little bit, reflect on patriarchy. Um, so Avino knows my um, you know, former supervisor and now colleague and friend Denise Candiotti. Um, she wrote a few years ago in relation to what was happening mainly in North Africa and Egypt um, that patriarchy as we uh, know it no longer exists because patriarchy has been challenged from so many angles by uh, women virtue was virtue of their education, their labor force participation, their political participation, legal reform, but also men who do not fit uh, sort of heteronormative ideas of masculinity. And so that was challenging, that's challenging patriarchy as well. And what Denise Candiotti has been arguing, I've been sort of trying to look at it as well in different contexts is sort of the idea that because patriarchy feels threatened, uh, it's kind of slashing back in even more violent ways to try to hold on to um, authoritarianism, militarism, heteronormativity. And so she's coined this term masculinist restoration to explain the extreme violence and the sort of targeting of women or, or men who by virtue of their sexuality or ethnicity, race, class do not fit in ideal uh, masculinities. And I, I'm sort of wondering what do you think around it? I mean, about this, are we witnessing, you know, patriarchy is, or is there something happening to patriarchy that sort of explains the very gendered um, resistance and backlash uh, that is very much focusing on resisting body politics and controlling sexuality, controlling women's bodies? Um, yeah, I'm curious to know what you think about it. I don't know, like, uh, anyone like to start? I think Sarah looks like Sarah. Yeah. Abbott looks like Sarah, she was... would you like to? Have <laughs> yeah, I was waiting. Story. Anyone would like to yeah. start? Okay. Yeah. Um, actually, I would be thinking about you, like through it, Nadia. And while you were talking about patriarchy and how it's being challenged, for some odd reason, like uh, I kept on thinking about the current uh, situation in Egypt and the crackdown on the TikTok women. So when you look at the TikTok women, basically it wasn't. Uh, the violence that was directed towards them, it was mostly state violence. Uh, that Sorry, was Sarah, maybe you can, if you can very briefly explain to those uh, viewers who don't actually know what happened. Yeah, sure. I was about to. So basically, there was a crackdown on uh, women influencers who belong to a middle and working class uh, Egypt uh, on social media who were using uh, TikTok as an application to actually express themselves. Uh, they weren't like, they're not necessarily uh, identify themselves as feminists, but then again, like feminism is a practice and a lifestyle. They don't, it's not a marker at the end of the day. And um, what happened is that some male YouTubers um, were provoked by the material that they were presenting because they were basically uh, challenging uh, societal norms, heteronormative norms. Um, and they started filing cases against them, like YouTubers and male lawyers. And actually the public prosecution office took the cases seriously and uh, the public arrests uh, were uh, started. Um, 
so here we're seeing like it's not like for example what was happening in Upantish uh, during Upantish time or even uh, during revolutionary time where it, you see a clear sexual violence or sexual assault or rape case but what you're seeing is that some influences maybe because they belong to and here also intersectionality you see also intersectionality as well they belong to middle and uh, working class Egypt so probably um, they don't have someone to back them um, who are basically uh, arrested and turned into criminals because they're expressing themselves and dancing like upper class Egyptians and maybe uh, talking about, like openly talking about, uh, for example, um, Sherry Hanum, for example, was talking about her uh, shaving uh, body hair, shaving routines. So she was very open and she was talking openly about topics that maybe this heteronormative uh, male subject uh, is kind of provoked that this person is managing to make more money than him, to have more views, uh, viewers than him. Uh, and from that, uh, you see this kind of uh, uh, how the state actually were challenged and provoked by uh, um, um, how can I say it, uh, by their autonomy, their body autonomy. Um, and then like they, under the new law, there is a new law called uh, uh, cyber crime law. It was in 2018, the law. And it was basically, I think it was implemented uh, at the time they started actually uh, um, arresting uh, the TikTok women, or at least we, uh, or some of us started to actually realize the dangers of this uh, law, uh, the new law in place, when these attacks and these crackdown and uh, the public arrests were taking place. So I think the TikTok women in a way, they, they might, I'm not sure, but I think they kind of, uh, challenge or give us a new uh, perception of uh, different faces of patriarchy uh, when uh, I don't know like I'm, I'm thinking what do you think Nadia like talking about the TikTok women and yeah I mean I think that's one example of uh, patriarchy feeling feeling threatened because uh, clearly they're overstepping you know, boundaries that even when you think back a few years ago in Egypt, you know, would not have been possible. Uh, and, you know, I think there are um, so many different uh, inroads that women and also men have made to challenge. But I guess the question is, um, does that mean that patriarchy is not at work anymore? You know, and I guess it's sort of a matter of em emphasis, you know, are we are we witnessing this uh, really attempt to restore uh, masculinist authoritarianism? Yes, definitely. Uh, but is it the same across? I mean, I certainly think when I look at Iraq, for example, it's very different from what I see in Egypt. So I think there are there are variations, actually. Variations yeah. yeah. What about what do you I think, Ravina? Oh, sorry. No, I was just going to say, like, of course, like patriarchy, it's still there, it's still yeah. present, just like keep on changing how yeah. it uh, respond to new challenges. Yeah. When it's provoked. Mm -hmm. Yes, I was going to say that I think the underpinning uh, architecture of patriarchy still exists. Yeah. I think that, that it reinvents itself and projects itself as, for instance, masculinist authoritarianism is, is absolutely true, but that, that the framework that underguards it Mm. is patriarchal i think yeah. we, we cannot run away from that just yet and i think yeah. for instance the production of ideas around toxic feminists and uh, all of this uh, is that yeah. response it's that yes. um fragility that that is emanating from an architecture that is feeling threatened yeah yeah, yeah i agree with that um so i'm suggesting dan um i think you have uh, one more, more sort of broader question and then after that uh, we'll open it up for Q and A, then. Sure. So, so I'm actually drawing from uh, the, the, one of the questions I was going to ask uh, Owino about her her chapter, but I want to broaden it out and perhaps make it to the larger group. So there's an old literature uh, in my discipline in anthropology that talks about the struggles between generations and particularly between older and younger men, and uh, of course much of that suggests that what what they're struggling over is access to and control over women's bodies. 
Um, and today, young men in, across Africa uh, complain about the obstacles to marriage. And I guess my question has to do with, you know, um, the degree to which you think that the current patriarchal gerontocracy, to the extent that there is a patriarchal gerontocracy, is similar or different from the past, and maybe related to that, um, are, are younger men who are stuck in, in weighthood and, 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 and youthhood women's allies against patriarchy, or is it more complicated than that? In what ways are they allies or not? So I'm asking for people to think about the relationship between patriarchal, patriarchy and gerontocracy, and specifically about how you see young men in these, in these struggles. So I'll, I'll, I'll go. So I think that in a lot of ways, uh, there are continuities. And those continuities, I think, have been exacerbated by the economic conditions across many African countries that have not necessarily allowed us to revisit how we structure uh, gender relations alongside the restructuring of economic and political conditions. So we are shifting the modalities of how our societies are claiming the open market, are claiming uh, electoral politics, are claiming uh, technology, you know, but we are doing that on the basis of a social system that we are insistent should remain the same. So that's in the same way I often argue that uh, the fear around uh, uh, queer activism, the, queer, the fear around queer bodies is often a direct uh, uh, response to a fear around uh, the rupture of, of uh, heteronormativity as an underpinning pillar of how patriarchy operates. Because the minute you disrupt heteronormativity, in my perspective, you have disrupted the very thing that holds patriarchy together. Because heterosexuality is not just a mode of organizing sexuality, it's a mode of organizing the economic, political, and social conditions of the country. Whether you're thinking about labor, whether you're thinking about politics, legal frameworks, religion, culture, it, it sort of seeps through all of these systems. Now, one of the things that I've observed, particularly in, um, in social movements today, and I guess this is what the Egyptian chapter speaks to, the chapter on Cameroon and South Africa all speak to this in different ways, is that there's a deep reluctance on the part of our younger male comrades to rethink, the, to, to claim this moment as an opportunity to rethink how masculinities can look like for the betterment of our societies. And this reluctance to reclaim uh, uh, the opportunity to rethink masculinities, in my view, emanates from a broader discourse that has pitted uh, the, the, the gender equality uh, work led largely by women's rights organization as oppositional to, to, to freedom for men, right? So if, if I think about Kenya, one of the things that you hear a lot is where is the boy child? Where is the boy child? Why are you not engaging men and boys and these kinds of ideas? And one of my arguments back is, well, as somebody who does policy activism, I'm consistently engaging men in power. So what is this argument that men and boys are not being engaged? And people then begin to manufacture all kinds of fictional uh, statistics to illustrate that there is a, a, a the, that the, there's a lopsidedness in the ways in which outcomes, social and economic outcomes are being experienced by women and, and, and men as a result of this overemphasis on uh, the liberty and freedom of women and girls. I think that a lot of the allyship that has developed uh, most usefully has come from uh, allies within queer movements. So people who do not necessarily construct themselves in um, in the sort of deeply masculinist ways that society projects to many people, that is how men show up in the world. I think there is increasingly, as a result of authoritarian drift across different parts of the African continent, a recognition of the importance of cross-movement mobilization. And I want to go to Uganda here to offer an example. When the uh, what was uh, popularly known as the Bahati Bill, the anti-homosexuality bill that had a death penalty attached to it that came up in 2013-14 in, in Uganda. And that bill was not only just targeting the homosexual, it was targeting all organizations that were doing any work on sexual and reproductive health rights. Anyone who was doing work on HIV and AIDS was being targeted by that particular bill. Anyone doing work on sex worker rights uh, was being targeted. This was the first time in my view that you saw cross coalition mobilization and even those who thought that the queers, those queer things were too dirty for them to touch, be, 
came to the table, people who are doing work on governance, people who are doing work on human rights writ large, came around the table as a result of the threat to their own existence, as a result of the threat to their own material conditions. So I think that these moments that offer opportunities for allyship, but unless we, all, unless as movements, we begin to think much more radically about the accompanying rupture that is needed when we do economic and a social change in relation to gender work, the, the opportunities for greater allyship uh, uh, between men and women around broader questions of gender equality continues to be fraught. Uh, it continues to be fraught. Right, maybe I go to the Q&A now, uh, if no one wants to chip in here. We have a number of questions. Um, I suggest I'm going to read out a few and then so to gather them and then can answer them jointly. So the first one is by Gita Busmaha. Uh, Gita says, I feel it is important to shed light on the status of youth in terms of political change and is asking what are the priorities given to youth as political leaders? Uh, then I have a question here by Sonia Rupcic. A question to all panelists. I was wondering if you could talk to the relationship between feminist movements and criminal justice, particularly around matters of gender-based violence. Sarah Abid, for example, spoke about legal reforms around sexual harassment. Avino talked about the criminalization of young men. So to what extent are feminist and youth movements promoting more muscular, carceral state responses towards violence, solutions grounded in policing, prosecution and punishment. Is there a debate amongst activists about how the state should be involved and how are these debates playing out? So that's quite a big question. So maybe I stop here and ask you to get, yeah, to maybe Sarah, if you want to start with the last one and then uh, I find, uh, I'll find out whether Sarah and Avina want to also contribute. Uh, thank you, Sonia, for asking this question. It's actually one of the uh, questions that has been raised, especially for those, uh, especially during this uh, current movement, uh, about our strategies and tactics and how we want to take this forward. But also one of the things that was uh, that many of us agree agreed on that we can't tell uh, survivors and victims of sexual violence which direction to take, whether to resort to the state and the criminal justice or to actually try to find new ways. Because at this moment, uh, as we speak, some, uh, some women, they don't have any other resort than resorting to, uh, to the criminal justice, even though it's it still like fell short in acknowledging uh, domestic violence, uh, anal rape or rape, other, other forms of rape, and on other fronts when it comes to sexual violence. Um, so, for example, uh, the defendant, uh, they filed a case, uh, the, the survivor and victim, uh, victim of uh, sexual violence of the ferment crime, she filed a case. And this is when uh, the witnesses in this case were turned into criminals. And this is when uh, people started realizing, of course, some of us would be realizing this at an early stage that uh, what is the limitation of state and to what extent we want to involve the state when it comes to these issues, especially it only sometimes uh, um, strength them to actually uh, uh, expand their power and uh, control our bodies. Um, so what I want to say uh, is that at this at this time, at this moment, many women started to realize that maybe the state is not uh, the only avenue or the only place to go to. And maybe uh, shaming and naming is, is one strategy. But I think like we're still at this early stage of discussing that some are actually against the death penalty and against the whole idea or notion of criminal justice. And some are inspired by the uh, BLM movement in the US, while others think that it's actually totally injustice to actually try to, uh, or it's not realistic to actually try to, uh, uh, try to apply some of 
what is going on or the movement that is uh, happening in the US now, given uh, that women in the first place, like until today, uh, the violations that is happening and taking place is, is from uh, our circles and the progressive left. Um, so I think the tension is there and it's an ongoing process, uh, discussion and I don't have a clear answer for it. I might have a stand or an opinion, but at the same time, I can't impose it. Uh, and I think one of the good things about this movement is that it's a learning process. It's a learning and unlearning. And some people like those who, because uh, at the same time, like the most of the participants, it's a kind of inter intergenerational uh, movement. So you'd find those who, uh, might have not really uh, lived the revolution. Uh, those new, like really young in their, even they're not even in their twenties who are participating in this movement and they haven't actually, or even like physically participated in the revolution. So they haven't, they don't really have the experience to actually confront the state and um, its power and to what extent it's brutal and they're still learning and we're learning together. and. Um, that's my take on that. Like it's it's very confusing, and I think myself, I'm always um, I feel like I'm so confused because part of me, like I'm against the, the death penalty. I'm not someone who I think I would resort to the criminal justice. But at the same time, I can't uh, impose my views on others or other uh, women who decide to resort to the criminal justice, and I will actually support them. Like I, I can't even just leave them there because. Uh, I'm not fully uh, agreeing with their approach. Yeah, well, I mean, I, uh, as you say, I don't think there is a clear cut answer. And when we look at the history of um, feminism in, I mean, I'm more familiar with the Middle East and North Africa than, you know, uh, the African continent more broadly, but certainly that has been a big tension sort of um, in how far do we focus on legal reform? In how far do we work, try to influence the state or work with the state? Um, at which point does it become counterproductive because the state is clearly the problem when we, we're dealing with an authoritarian militarized state? And uh, I think that um, it's, it's a very tricky uh, question. And sometimes I think uh, it looks more clear cut from the outside, but when you're inside, it's much more complex. So I'm always wary of people sort of making holier than thou statements about this. It's it's a very tricky one. Yeah, especially when you're living the, the event itself. Yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if either Avina or Sarah Nukdala wanted to come in on uh, this or the other question. I would just underscore what you both said, that I think while the, the discourse and the scholarship on, on carcerality is, offers us a lot to think about in relation to how policing, securitization, and all of these regimes uh, uh, shape uh, our lives transnationally, right? So what is happening in the US uh, is, is, is in part uh, a reflection of what is happening in other parts of the world through the range of military funding and security funding that's reaching our shores. Uh, th that security funding is, is a factor of how the, the new empire is working. That security funding is stifling local conversations around a social change and transformation because we need a stable regime here. So we're not going to interfere with that regime because holding Egypt stable is useful to not, uh, uh, a geopolitical demand in that area that will protect the US interests. So there's a lot of connections in terms of how carcerality functions globally. And I think if we looked at it from that framework, it offers us a, a very useful way to build transnational solidarity and transnational movement work. Because I think once we unsettle this global power dynamics, it becomes much easier to then begin to think about how those transnational dynamics have real repercussions on the socioeconomic conditions that are rendering some people much more liable to resort to certain forms of criminalize, uh, criminality or to resort uh, or, or to be on the sidelines of greater state surveillance um, because of discourses such as violent extremism or terror. Um, like Sarah and, and Nadia, I, I hold uh, um, 
some reservations, uh, particularly on, on certain crimes uh, and, and, and on, on some of those crimes, such as sexual violence and other forms of, of, of what I consider to be deep crimes against personhood, against agency. Uh, those are decisions I would leave to the person who's experiencing uh, that the injustice to determine how it is that they want the issue to be dealt with. Mm -hmm. I think there's a lot of conversation today around restorative justice, but we're all grappling with what restorative justice means. And I think folks, the, the, you know, the BLM movement, Black American folks who are talking about restorative justice are keen on thinking about restorative justice in a context in which the imprisonment of black men and black women is high, right? So this is a, this is about state violence enacted on on on, on a large section of the community. Uh, how do you deal with other forms of, of violence that are indeed underpinned by the way the state is function is organized and how it organizes communities, but which um, which complicate our social and political relations? I, I agree, it is it's one that requires more thought. Um, and it's an active debate uh, to respond directly to the person who's asking uh, the question. It's an active and live debate amongst lots of feminist movements that I'm familiar with. Yeah, and also, you know, I guess there are different phases of protest and revolutionary movements when we actually do have trust in the state. I mean, especially when there is sort of change and we want to, you want the state to protect us. We want the, so this is, um, you know, the, there's also an element of temporality um, let me move to a couple of other questions here. Um, there's one by Teresa Lewis, uh, who's thanking us for the panel and saying, as an election analyst, I have worked in Africa and other parts of the world, and women's youth involvement in politics is something that always raises a lot of questions in terms of the lack of involvement. Are there currently any efforts to train young women to be involved in political life and deal with political violence? Do you see a rise in local NGOs which would tackle such training efforts? And a uh, question by Radhika Moral, uh, which is particularly for Avino. I would love to hear more about the point you made regarding the centrality of material questions when thinking about political change. Despite the fact that considerable women do become beneficiaries of women's movements who assume positions of power, they're often not effective in terms of addressing dissimilar women's interests. How do these differential specific material histories play out in the context of protest and resistance by various feminist groups? Uh, thank you. And I think uh, other folks can also pick up on the second question because I believe that some of your chapters address this intergenerational dynamics. I think on the question of training and women and young people's political participation, I would argue as somebody who was a professional feminist before I came into the academy, is that there are a dime and a dozen of youth and women's rights organizations that have been doing capacity building. In fact, every election cycle, I have participated in tons of conversations and training programs to equip women you know, to run for office, to train them on their political manifesto development, to train them on public speaking. And what we've learned from all of these processes, this is not about the lack of capacity, right? This is not about their inability to do these things. This is about a political environment that consistently edges out people on the basis of age and on the basis of gender. And so it's really the infrastructure of political organizing that needs to shift rather than uh, equipping people to work within an infrastructure that is already flawed. And a lot of the conversations that are happening now in relation to young people in political leadership or women in political leadership is less about uh, approaching it as a def from a deficit point of view, is to say that they lack something, so we need to equip them with something in order to enter the space, but to rather recognize the, the deficiencies in that space and how you, you uh, rectify those de deficiencies so that everyone can have uh, a level playing field. Um, so that would be my response to that. It's not a lack of, it's not the need for more training, it's the need to re-engineer the architecture of political organizing across many parts of the African continent. Um, yeah. Yeah, thanks, Avino. Um, Sarah, Sarah Nukdala, would you like to come in on any of the questions? Yeah, just to add to um, what was Awino was saying, I think in Sudan in particular, the role of the previous regime was to suffocate civic space. So now with the removal of the regime, there is more space for local NGOs to go about their activities. Um, and the organization that I currently work for is actually, um, you know, 
putting all their effort towards creating a, a network between um, Sudanese women across the 18 states in Sudan and a system of um, information sharing. But I think it's also important to remember that, you know, feminism and a feminist future insists on a freedom that's beyond the state. And, and that's not like our ultimate goal, <laughs> but um, that is sort of happening right now in Sudan. Um, they're dipping their feet in new civic space, open civic space. Yeah, thank you. Well, I understand that things are quite uh, fluid and moving. Uh, uh, as we we speak uh, in the Sudan, I mean it's uh, still seems to be one of the places that elicit more hope, <laughs> and we hope that it will stay this way. Uh, Sarah uh, Abit, would you like to come in on any of the questions? No. So maybe then let me return to the second question, which yes. is about the differences across women. And I think that for me, my approach to this question is an approach that concerns any movement, right? So even when we, are, and I always return to this example, that when we think about the liberation struggles across the African continent, we, we seem to think that uh, everyone uh, was sold on the idea of liberation, that everyone believed the liberation leaders when they said freedom will come, and these are the ways in which to do it. I think the processes of movement building teach us that it takes a lot of work to get people on board towards a, a shared direction. And, and it's about recognizing that at times, what you need is a critical mass of people who can advance a particular agenda. And once the, once the others see that there's an opening that will actually shift and transform their lives, you bring them along. Earlier on today, I was talking in a different platform about the old school work that some of us used to do, which is around conscientization. Now, conscientization work was very different from awareness raising, right? Awareness raising today is about going out to tell people about laws, policies, and your rights. Conscientization work was around deep rooted ideological work, which is around analyzing the systems of power, the structures of power, and how we are all implicated in these structures of power. Pushing people to unlearn the ways in which we both exercise power, the ways in which we inhabit and embody different forms of power and, and, and contribute uh, to sustaining our own oppression sometimes. And this is the work, draws on the work of people like Paolo Freire, uh, Augusto Boal, and others in terms of liberation uh, scholarship and liberation pedagogy, if you will. So uh, I, I think the reality that in any movement, whether it's feminist or otherwise, that there will always be differing visions of how we, we achieve change, we cannot ignore it. Let's not assume that because we are feminist, we all have a shared idea of what that feminism or womanhood or femininity looks like. My approach, and this is just because I've grown a little bit older, when you need to move, you move. You carry the few people that you have with you and move and move the process forward. It is always likely that those who are slower to catch on because they're still struggling with religion, culture, all of these things that we've imbibed from when we were children and that have become so part of us that we do not think of them as things that we've acquired. We instead, we are, we are considering them as part of our DNA. When the time that that opening happens, happens they will join us. But to, to halt the movement because you want to carry anyone, everyone with you is a strategy that has never worked for any revolutionary process. Yeah, I think I strongly agree with that. Um, okay, I'm going to read out another question. The question is by Dotun Ayubade. Uh, congratulations to you all on this important book. This has been illuminating a question of questions. How do you encounter and engage with this with the idea of victimhood in the social movements you study? In other words, how do women reconcile a social order that seeks their victimization, the emotional, physical harm from state-based sexual violence, for instance, with the actual mobilization around these issues? What are the limits of victimhood as a useful concept? I'm thinking about Bokesh's description of the young woman whose youth became framed around a need for intervention as a basis for denying her rogue political agency. Uh, Sarah Arbet, would you like to start us off on this question? Uh, okay, so uh, when I think about the notion of victimhood, I think one of the interesting uh, debates that has been also rising around this notion is 
the tension between uh, terms such as victim or survivor. Uh, and it was actually one of the things that was opened uh, recently uh, among us. And uh, we're talking about the limitation of both uh, notions. Um, but here I'm not talking about victimhood in, in uh, relation to um, uh, I'm, I'm talking about it in relation to the self, because I think one part of it is actually uh, we as victims and survivors of sexual violence. Um, I don't know how to say it, but maybe you can say. How do we? Sometimes we need to identify ourselves in uh, in dealing with the emotional and physical harm, and how do we see ourselves? And how, for example, the term survivors, survivors actually has harmed some of uh, the people who were uh, 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 who encountered state-based sexual violence, uh, even during revolutionary times. Uh, and for me, this was one of the very interesting. Uh, topics and debates surrounding this notion of victimhood, that how it even starts from us and uh, this negative connotation around the notion of victimhood that we continuously uh, try to de-associate ourselves from this term as if uh, by doing that, so we will, uh, we're actually, uh, I don't know, like maybe it's not the right word, but let me just say it, feminist enough. Uh, but it's not actually like that, like part of it is showing up your vulnerability and showing which term you resonate with and if victimhood is one of it, then just like the whole feeling of or resonating with the term victim in order to actually um, deal with the emotional, physical uh, harm um, is one thing that I think we shouldn't avoid. I'm not sure if I'm, if I'm actually answering uh, the question. Um, uh, but when I, for me, this is how I think of the concept and how I think of how it could be useful, uh, in the context of emotional and physical harm from state-based violence or even, uh, gender-based violence, uh, more broadly. Uh, and I don't, and I'm, I'm actually, I'm actually tired from, um, this negative connotation with the term and that we're trying to disassociate ourselves from it rather than actually confronting it. And maybe sometimes if someone need to embrace it, then embrace it and to each his own in a way, like if a survivor or a victim, uh, like they choose how they want to uh, reconcile with it. Mm -hmm. And yeah. Yeah. Yeah, thank you, Sarah. Uh, Sarah Nukdala, would you like to come in on this question as well? No, maybe not. Avino, what about you? No, I would agree with Sarah Abbott that uh, in thinking about victimhood, what I do is Im impose a power analysis on it. And anyone in any situation, whether I'm carjacked, whether somebody robs me in my house, that they're, it's a violation. It's a violation of my personhood. It's a violation of my agency. And the intent of such actions is to take power away from you. And you cannot ignore that in any situation where you are framed as a victim, whether the African continent considers itself a victim of global economic forces, that there's a process of power being taken away through a whole range of networks that are designed to put you in a position of subjugation. So framed in that way, what victimhood does is offer us a, a, a powerful basis from which to think about how power circulates, uh, which structures, which institutions, which individuals benefit from power being located in them at different moments and at different times. Um, and so for me, I, I do not think it to be problematic. I think that if you think about it through the lens of a power analysis, you're able to pinpoint the machinations of power. I think specifically in relation to questions of sexual violence, I have listened to people who have experienced uh, grievous forms of sexual violence and, and this rush, for instance, to turn them into survivors is, the one, is one in which they argue that is not a helpful one because what it does is take away from the very experience of violation that they're experiencing. To, to become a survivor of something is to reclaim your agency back. So don't force people to reclaim agency if they have not had the time to get to that particular moment. Mm 
And if we impose the idea of victimhood into a larger sort of political economy analysis, if we think about Africa as a victim of structural adjustment programs, to become a survivor of structural adjustment programs is to reclaim our agency, to construct the, the, the economic uh, you know, frameworks that allow us to become an equal player, to engage as an equal partner on the, the global economic stage. So think about it through power, and then you we begin to see the opportunities that it does offer us to think about masculinist authoritarianism mm -hmm. or patriarchy writ large. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, uh, we have a few more questions from the audience, but I'm going to turn to Dan. Um, then do you have a, a, a sort of broader conceptual question for everyone? Yeah, so um, so the state has loomed large in, in a lot of these discussions and implicit and in some places explicit in the book is the importance of understanding and perhaps promoting politics and political agendas beyond the state and even beyond, as uh, Wino uh, alluded to earlier in her comments, even beyond conventional non-state actors like NGOs. So I was wondering if, if you would be willing to, any of you would be willing to say more about your view regarding the desired or likely unfolding of the relationship between social movements and the state in Africa, and in particular, perhaps comment on in what ways a feminist political project is integral to those outcomes. And uh, before you answer, um, because there's a question here uh, that really links to your question, Dan. So I'm going to um, interject that here. This is by Marlon Jimenez Oviedo, who says, uh, first of all, he thanks, uh, he's thanking everyone for this conversation. He's saying, I'm interested in hearing the panelist ideas about what Sarah just said, a feminist future for freedom, freedom is one beyond the state. So um, if you could also reflect on that, please. I, I think like I, I totally agree, of course, with Sora uh, in regards to a feminist future for freedom is one beyond the state. And I think this is something that we keep at the back of our mind uh, while uh, trying to push forward or in our approach with movement building and so on. Um, is this achievable? It's something that uh, I think it's it's difficult to think about and to actually reimagine it in itself. Uh, it sounds like you know heaven, but what we can do uh, for me is that we work towards it, and I think this is what we're doing. Even if we meet some obstacles, even if uh, there is some tensions in movement, uh, we disagree on the agenda. Even if we sometimes we have to work with the state or not with the state, I think this is something that we have to have at the back of our uh, our mind while moving forward. Uh, and for me, for example, like the current movement, I never I never thought that I would be witnessing it, and we have been, like we're now witnessing it because of the accumulated and continuous effort of previous feminist movements and how it's interconnected. Uh, interconnected with each other in the sense that it paved the way to actually uh, reimagine uh, this world that is beyond the state in one way or another. Yeah, so I, I will be up front and say that I am perhaps uh, a bit disciplined by the idea of the state and the nation state, right? Um, but I do recognize uh, and see the possibilities of imagining uh, life and societies that are not disciplined by these geographical boundaries and uh, you know these juridical ideas of the nation state that more often than not are, are not of our making, right? Uh, and so here I exclude new nation states that have emerged in sort of very evolved and self-determined ways from those colonial structures that were set up without consideration or consultation of the inhabitants. So I see these possibilities and we see these possibilities through the sort of transnational feminist work that many of us are involved in and engaged in. But we also see the limits or the constraints that are put in that transnational feminist work through the very idea of migration, immigration, borders and policing that impacts how we can all connect with each other despite a shared uh, interest. So I, I think that in the imagining or the centrality of the feminist vision around this in, in terms of thinking beyond the state is a lot of work that I've begun to see across different feminist movements that begin to prioritize very specific ideas around safety and security, for instance. When you look at the work that is emerging from 
Urgent Action uh, Fund Africa, which is a rapid response grant maker that gives funding to women human rights defenders across the different parts of the continent, particularly those who are facing direct attack from state actors. When you think about the work of folks like Yara Salam uh, based in Egypt, you know, wonderful new publication that they put together around even the finest warriors that reflects on the importance of collective care and well being. These two uh, uh, projects, if you will, this two, you know, one that is based on funding and another that is based on thinking collectively, are specifically designed to think about how to care for movements, how to think about so building societies and political projects for change that are not anchored primarily on influencing the state, on influencing policy making, or on demanding that the state provides security when the state itself is uh, defined as the person who's creating that insecurity. So in terms of a very tangible or tangible examples of how feminist activists are actively reimagining the ways in which they organize and build community, we're already seeing lots of that that is, in, uh, that is emerging within our activist spaces that we must look to, largely because of how insecurity is experienced in our societies today. I think that for me, again, the, the protests, if we return to the sort of underpinning uh, conversation of this book, which is around protest, protest movements are pushing governments and are, are, are forcing governments to recognize that this, the architecture that we have created to discipline how regimes have conversations with their citizens is not functioning. Right? The very idea that people are saying that forget your election. Yes, it's coming in a year, but I'm not waiting for that election. I'm going to have a direct conversation with you about my dissatisfaction on the streets and the squares is, in, 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 in my opinion, another avenue through which young people across the African continent are articulating very clearly the possibilities of governance that are not disciplined around particular frameworks of policy influencing, elections, uh, electoral dynamics, for instance. So these are the sort of two offers that I would give in terms of very tangible things that I see as moving us beyond the state, that moving us to an idea of freedom that does not discipline us towards the frames that uh, many who have done NGO policy work have become uh, quite accustomed to, but we, have also, we also know, and this is the argument that all of the authors in this book make, that even as we imagine such futures, and that is why the centrality of feminism looms large here, is that we must center a, a, a political project of freedom and justice as one that does not reproduce those very uh, patriarchal dynamics that we're trying to run away from within the statist uh, formation. Um, and and this, this, is, this is where the feminist political project comes in. It's disrupting ideas of gender identity, disrupting notions of, of, of gender and sexuality, and pushing us to think beyond these constructs. Thank you so much. I think uh, uh, we had uh, temporarily lost Sarah Nogdala, but she's back with us. Sarah, would you come in on this question um, that's linking with something that you said before in terms of um, our feminist futures to be de-linked from the state. Um, can you come in on this? Sorry about that. Um, yeah, so what I was saying is that um, women's political participation or women's training to you know, be politically active is um, it's only a, an element of you know, the larger project of liberation. Um, so in the case of Sudan, that it's it's great that you know women are able to build these. Sorry. Um, so it seems that we've lost again. Um, Sarah had said that there are problems in terms of electricity cuts. Um, so I'm um, we're hoping that she'll be joining us uh, before the end of the session, but I'm going to proceed and ask uh, probably what will be the last question, uh, which is picking up on something that Avino mentioned before in terms of transnational feminism and transnational solidarities. And I'd just like us to we conclude on reflecting a bit on what does a transnational feminist lens actually contribute to our understanding of gender protest and political change in Africa? And, and what are you um, individually, collectively hoping for in terms of transnational feminist solidarities? I mean, I know you've already had addressed that a bit, but I, I 
I'd like you to expand and uh, yeah, I'd like to hear uh, as well from Sarah. Do you have something uh, on that? Sure. Shall I start? Yes. Okay. I'll jump in. Uh, of course, transnational solidarity is important. And uh, for me, uh, it's a way to create pressure, especially during hard times. But at the same time, it's, um, it's a tool that should be used very cautiously because sometimes uh, the demands or the safety or the security for, for example, the local uh, protesters or activists might be uh, at risk. So I think it's, it, it's this as opposing to global feminism or this uh, image around global feminism, I find like transnational solidarity is more sensitive in, the, uh, sensitive in this regard. It takes into consideration uh, 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 diverse ca uh, categories and uh, it acts uh, accordingly. So when, for example, even uh, during the current time, one of the things that uh, uh, I believe that transnational solidarity is uh, crucial is how we negotiated with different actors uh, in bringing what's happening in Egypt, uh, internationally speaking. Uh, and why, for example, we'll not use this tactic, but this tactic like the other one. Uh, so here where I find it useful. And the other thing is that uh, how ideas travel across uh, places, like different places, and how we can actually learn from others. So for example, uh, as Awin was mentioning, when it comes to uh, care or collective care or creating spaces, so how we can actually learn from uh, the BLM movement now, while we're actually uh, um, witnessing or living uh, uh, something that's happening now like widely in Egypt, like this feminist uh, revolution or how it's uh, hashtagged. Um, so for example, uh, the book of Sara Ahmed was widely shared, especially the survival kit. So for us in closed feminist groups, for us to think and rethink with her how we can actually apply these ideas. When should we engage and when we should uh, kind of disengage when there is an activist uh, burnout, for example. And here where I find uh, feminist books, uh, along with the experiences of other uh, movements are very useful and how we can connect and draw on similarities and differences while acknowledging both uh, and how we can learn and unlearn from each other. Uh, how we can learn from the uh, uh, from what, what was happening in Sudan and still and continue to happen in Sudan, what we can learn from the BLM movement, uh, what we can learn from what's going on now in Nigeria, for example, uh, and what happened in Beirut, uh, in, uh, sorry, Lebanon. <laughs> uh, so that's my take on transnational solidarity, <laughs> or that's how I, I find, like, I, for me, I, uh, I think it's useful and important in this regard. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Well, um, we have just a couple of minutes left and I'd like to ask Avino to reflect on this uh, point, please. Thank you. And I've just seen one more question. So I'll sort of wrap it up together. Somebody asked about uh, healing and how, you know, movement center questions of healing. So to underscore the point that uh, Sarah has made, which is my consistent uh, clarion call everywhere I go, we must read, we must read, we must read. We must know each other. We cannot build any transnational work if we do not understand our histories. We do not understand the work that has preceded us. We do not make connections across uh, the continent with each other. I think it is more, uh, more often than not, we look outside the continent for, the, for lessons. Uh, and yet what we know, at least between 2015 and now, is that there have been many other forms of, of, of direct action and change that have led to political leaders, strongmen, leaving political office with all kinds of dynamics that it has wrought at a national level that we can all learn from across the continent. So yes, while I echo the importance of looking outside the African continent, which is critical, particularly as part of a larger conversation about black solidarity, which I'm uh, uh, deeply committed to, I'm also deeply insistent on the need for us to, to bridge these divides that sort of uh, uh, exist across the African continent, created, of course, by the history of colonialism, the Arab North, the Lusophone uh, Southern part of Africa, Francophone West Africa, Anglophone uh, you know, East and West Africa. So this, 
These are divides that I think technology today has allowed us to bridge effectively, largely because of the social media activism. But on the back of that, we also see a lot of intellectual work that is being done within the social media space that allows this effective bridging to happen. So read, 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 let's know each other. Let's know the work that is in our buckets. Let's build those connections with one another. The second point that I would like to make is around the global power dynamics. So one of, and I've seen a couple of examples in the last 10 years of how people leverage their power uh, in the global north towards the, uh, for the service of action in the global south. Uh, because we know of old school activism that involved somebody sitting in the global north, uh, somebody like me here uh, sitting in the global north and saying, how can we help you, right? Now, if you're a citizen of, of the UK, if you're a citizen of America, I'm not, right? And uh, you want to extend action, uh, to uh, a place in the African continent that was formerly colonized by that power or where the American government continues to have deep vested interests in a range of ways. Your power lies in challenging your government. And for me, that is what transnational solidarity means in ways that actually pay attention to the power dynamics. In the same way that I argue that it is not the task of non-queer allies to speak for queer folk, it's not the task of progressive patriarchs to speak for women's rights activists. We already know our demands. We are very clear about the issues. Your task is to challenge and use your relative privilege within your spheres of influence. And in this way, we do not end up reproducing those old binaries around the global south, south and north, invoking solidarity, invoking feminism in ways that is actually harmful and reproducing these power hierarchies, even as we work uh, as social movements. Um, finally, on the question of healing circles, I think there's been an emerging uh, growth of, uh, of work, particularly around uh, feminist care, that uh, some of it, the one that I'm most familiar with comes from Latin America, but an increasing uh, amount of work that is happening to return to our own histories of collective healing, well-being, and care that exists, that has always existed within our societies. I have just posted on the chart the book and the collection by Yara Salam on even the finest warriors, because that, in my view, offers you an expansive overview of activists who have been on the front line, who have been arrested, imprisoned by various regimes, and how they're actively thinking and recuperating um, uh, historical, collective, and innovative strategies for thinking about healing and care. I think there is an insistence, and one of the chapters uh, by the last one by fellow Jean and, and the co-author speak quite deeply around the notion of care in relation to the protest moment and beyond. Um, and so this is something that is, is a live conversation um, and one that we continue to think with actively. Yeah, and one that's of course extremely acute in the current context of the pandemic as well. Well, I'd like to thank you, Avino, and also Sarah Abed and uh, Sarah Nukdala. I would like to thank my co-host, uh, Professor Daniel Smith, and uh, all of you who joined us and posed questions. And um, we will be, uh, we have recorded this event, so we'll be making it available and you can share it with your friends and colleagues who haven't had a chance to attend today. So thank you very much and goodbye. <laughs>